Uh, we'll go to the next uh, speaker, and that would be me. So a um, uh, quick introduction. Uh, I practice in Gulfport, Mississippi. Um, board certified in internal medicine, nutrition, and psychopharmacology. I'm a fellow in the Obesity Society. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today on nutrition therapy in the clinic. And specifically, um, if uh, we don't get through this talk in time, uh, the resource uh, material is at booth 1000 uh, in the uh, display area. Uh, so what I'd like to do is change for a minute your paradigm about nutrition therapy versus weight loss. Uh, how many people in here do uh, offer weight loss as part of their clinic? A few. How many offer nutrition therapy unrelated to weight loss? A couple? Okay. All right. Um, when, people, when, a, when a patient comes to you and says they want to lose weight, they, and you ask them how much weight they want to lose, the average patient wants to lose 38% of their weight. Uh, they've been watching The Biggest Loser on TV, and they think it's just a normal, easy thing to do. Uh, when you ask a physician or a provider what they expect their patient to lose, they want them to lose somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of about 35 to 38%. Uh, that's a very, bariatric surgery produces about a 35% weight loss. Uh, gastric uh, um, restriction with banding uh, causes about a 25% weight loss. So the reality is uh, you're not going to see those type of numbers in the average patient. On the other hand, nutrition therapy, and again I'm an internist, uh, will get you results long before you lose any meaningful weight at all. And so uh, what I want to do is show you how that happens and why it happens add a potent, and I mean a potent clinical tool to your regimen that you are now using on patients and a potential revenue source. Uh, just a quick question, how many of you are internal medicine or internal medicine subspecialties in here? Nobody. Family practice? Few. Um, surgeons? A surgeon, all right. Chiropractic? Naturopaths? In, uh, how about uh, nurse practitioner or uh, physician assistant? Okay, anything else? Okay. Um, so we have a wide diversity, and um, I think you'll see some uh, elements of this depending on the type of practice that you have. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, so I've seen the evolution from the very beginning of uh, nutrition intervention to where we are today. And the one thing that I noticed, uh, I was shared an office with a guy who used to do Nathan Pritikin's uh, old uh, program, which is a very vegetarian, uh, difficult type, uh, it's not old, it's still Pritikin centers around, uh, regimen that produced really dramatic clinical results. And uh, how many people here have heard of Nathan Pritikin? More than usual. Uh, Ken Cooper? Okay, good. So a few people in this group know both of those pioneers. And Dr. Pritikin said you could reverse disease with diet. And he was a PhD. He was laughed off the medical scene at the time. Dr. Cooper was uh, stating that you could, you could slow or reverse disease with exercise. And he actually had his license reviewed by the state medical board in Texas uh, to, to uh, see if it was a valid claim. And uh, his license was threatened back at the time. I was in med school in the early 70s. So in that period of time, we've evolved to a point where, uh, thank God, all of that's passed. Dr. Cooper's done more research in the world than anybody on exercise and disease, uh, and we're up to the present. Uh, watching this for, for a decade or so, I started to measure the results that I was seeing in specific medical conditions back in 1995, and I developed uh, 13 to 15 clinical endpoints that I followed, and also was uh, challenged with eating behaviors in patients who were struggling with uh, how to maintain their diets, and I developed a, an eating inventory in 1998. And about all that time, Engineered diets were coming along, the, the, the liquid diets, the very low-calorie diets. Atkins was uh, uh, big on the scene, uh, causing a big hoopla because it was against everything traditional dietetics uh, was uh, preaching and teaching. And uh, they were saying that they were seeing results that uh, nobody else could really explain. And so if you couldn't explain it, it didn't really exist. And so all of this was happening in the late 80s and, and all through the 90s. And uh, about that time, uh, we started discovering um, uh, some proteins that we uh, found affect uh, physiology and uh, uh, metabolism dramatically. Uh, the nutrition boards in internal medicine, or nutrition boards in general, did not become available until 2001. And um, 
And I got psychopharmacology certified in 04 simply because I was the first so many patients that were gaining massive amounts of weight on psychotherapeutic drugs that I had to know how and why this was happening. My passion, my, my very, my, while I, nutrition is my primary subspecialty, my passion is neuroendocrinology and behavioral endocrinology. And uh, the psych drugs have kind of pushed that to the forefront uh, since they have shown clearly that by altering receptors in the body, you change metabolism. Um, the one thing, the empiric evolution of, of dietary science is that that means data that supports uh, what is being done is that you need a structure and a strategy if you're going to offer a nutrition therapy or diet therapy. Uh, there has to be a system of accountability, whether it be individual or group. It has to have some objective way of measuring it. Weight Watchers does it with a point system. It's very uh, good and clever. Uh, the program you use has to have some nutritional credibility. And again, through that evolution, both the very low calorie diets and Atkins have proven uh, scientifically what they do and how they do it. So they have gained that credibility as well as the usual traditional um, uh, recommendations for uh, nutrition intervention. Uh, but the thing that's really uh, been a uh, crystallizer of all this is the discovery of cytokines and the evolution of cytokine uh, endocrinology over the last 10 years. Uh, how many people in here know what a cytokine is? Okay, about half. The first time I gave this lecture in 03 to a bunch of cardiologists, three out of 100 people in the, in the audience raised a hand that they knew what a cytokine was. If you pick up the cardiology literature now, virtually every article in the literature is talking about the inflammatory process of atherosclerosis and the role cytokines play. I'm on the editorial board for uh, the Atherosclerosis Society uh, for their journal, and uh, the journal now is probably half cytokines, and that's only in an evolution from 03 to now. So six years, we've learned how this happens. More importantly to me, uh, the clinical measures that I uh, uh, determined in the mid-90s, I now can explain and understand as to what I was seeing and why I was seeing it. So what are the predictors of successful treatment? You want to off offer nutrition therapy in your, to your patients, what predicts success? Number one, has to taste good, has to have a lot of variety. Number two, it has to be very easy and convenient. It has to have a system of records that is also very easy and convenient. I used to do hour and a half programs in our clinic once a week to all of our patients. Uh, by doing a 20 second record keeping system, I found my results were actually better than an hour and a half once a week. Uh, it has to have exercise as a component. Patients have to be able to comply with the structure. So it had, they have to understand it. It has to be individualizable so that they can adapt it to their own uh, situation, spouses, cultures, work, etc. And if it's in your office, it cannot occupy a lot of your staff time. If it does, it won't uh, work. There are predictors of failed treatment, and these are also equally simple. Uh, if it tastes bad, patients will not do this indefinitely, which if it's going to be successful, they have to do. If it's rigid, if it causes guilt and avoidance, they will not do it. Uh, if, they, if they interpret that uh, weight management or nutrition intervention is a willpower issue, uh, you are doomed to fail. Uh, it is unlike uh, what they promote in The Biggest Loser. It is not a willpower issue. It is a discipline, and discipline is knowledge and skill practiced over time. It has nothing to do with willpower, which connotes character and power and the ability to do something under great duress. Uh, two different animals altogether. So they can't be isolated, shunned, and ostracized, whether it's the family, the work, and social events. If they do, it won't work. If, if it's inconvenient, it won't work. If there's no change in intuitive thinking and habits, it will not work. If I do this and I see that result, I have to understand, personally understand, what happened and why I felt better or why this result occurred. And so there, therefore it needs some element of teaching or education built into it. If you do all that, if you have good tasting programs that have all of these elements, uh, it still doesn't guarantee that your nutrition therapy pro program is going to be successful. Why not? because it's what I've called the rule of 20s. And that is 20% of people hate the fact that you're going to recommend a diet intervention to them. They smoke, they drink, they come to Las Vegas, they have a great time, they just they throw it in your face. And 20% uh, of, the, of the people you see are going to be uh, people like us in this room, they're health nuts, and they know so much you can hardly tell them anything. And they're going to argue with you on every point. You know what I'm talking about? And so uh, you have that group of people. And in between, you have the 20s that go on either side of that equation. And so your market probably will start out with patients who are in the middle. Uh, but if you see the results and if patients understand what 
processes uh, are happening and, and that word spreads to these outliers, they will eventually come into the fold. Most of my most dedicated patients are the, the group on the right who started out with the uh, angry and mad that they had to see me uh, referred by the doctor. If there's, uh, if there's no team effort in the office, it will fail. And your team is often uh, on the margins of this 20-20 ratio. You have 20% of your team who is anti-doing anything and feels um, intimidated by the process, and you have 20% who will argue with you on every point. And they can sabotage the effort in spite of all your good intentions. And if they have to do a lot more work and no, and no more pay, again, you're likely to be sabotaged. But the most important, the single most important thing that will determine success in a given clinic is what's the definition of success? What's the endpoint provider that you're trying to achieve? Is it weight? And how much? And when, are you, when, when is that weight sufficient? And, and when do you get there? If you're going down the road, what's, what's from point A to point B? Is it a medical outcome? Is it symptom relief? Are you trying to prevent something? What is it you're trying to prevent and how can you measure that? So what exactly are you treating precisely? Um, if you, uh, I would imagine every single person in this uh, room who sees uh, patients uh, tells them to lose weight or they come in saying, uh, doctor or, or nurse practitioner, I need to lose weight. Uh, and my first question to them is, for what? Why, why do you want to lose weight? What reason? And it's, they look at me usually with a stunned look um, well, you know, I feel bad. Okay, you feel bad. Let's define how you feel bad precisely, and then we can measure when that feeling bad is disappearing. Because otherwise, it's just a vague notion in the sky, and therefore you will never get to the end point of what you're trying to achieve. Um, specific diseases, you know, some doctors will throw a 1,200-calorie ADA diet on a piece of paper at a patient say, here's your diabetic diet, good luck, see you later. That's like handing them insulin and saying, here's your insulin, good luck, see you in a couple of years. It's, it's you know, borders on good practice, to say the least. So how do you measure the results and what and how are you going to measure it? Uh, you don't have to worry about business. Uh, this is the obesity trends in the U.S. You can see I'm from Mississippi. So uh, we are at the epicenter, literally, and uh, the diabetic epidemic is following uh, the obesity epidemic hand in hand. It's estimated that 20% of adults over 40 in Mississippi are diabetic now, 20%. Um, that, that is a staggering and sobering number since it's the most expensive disease that we have to treat. I want to give you two clinical cases that dramatize what I'm talking about in terms of medical outcomes. This is a 41-year-old, came in uh, 10 he was short of breath, he was swollen, he had four plus edema, he had 12,000 milligram proteinuria, that's a lot of protein spilling in his urine. Uh, his blood pressure was very high, 170 over 114, his pulse was rapid, he had, a, he had an S3 gallop, which is a heart failure gallop. He was, he was about the color of this, uh, this slide right here, he was kind of blue, uh, he weighed 414 pounds. He still had normal kidney function, surprisingly, his lipids were okay. His BNP was 218, his Doppler showed 39% ejection fraction. He was in heart failure. Clinically, I saw that. Laboratory test confirmed it. He had not had an MI yet. His EKG just showed sinus tachycardia. Uh, he had seen a doctor a month prior who put him on aldactone because he saw protein and he saw he was swollen. He refused hospitalization. Then he refused hospitalization when he saw me. I put him on a, on a nutrition plan, which is uh, the first seven days they go on a basically a liquid-type diet of uh, amino acids, uh, shakes, soups, and puddings, and so forth. First week, he lost 25 pounds, mostly of fluid, of course. His edema was down. He was less uh, short of breath. He was actually pink, and his blood pressure dropped pretty dramatically in one week, uh, from crisis levels to slightly high. Two weeks, he lost 43 pounds. Uh, his edema was uh, just trace. His, his, gal his heart failure gallop was gone. His breathing problems were gone. His heart failure BNP was down by half, and his blood pressure normalized. And that's in two weeks. <coughs> and in six weeks, he was completely asymptomatic. His edema was gone. His heart failure uh, BNP had returned to normal. His ejection fraction in his heart had gone from 39 to 60 percent. He'd gone from heart failure to normal uh, in six weeks. His proteinuria, which is a sign of endothelial damage and dysfunction, uh, gone from 12 grams, 12,000 milligrams to 400, and his blood pressure was maintaining normal. So in six weeks, this guy lost a lot of fluid, uh, some fat, but more importantly, he went from the edge of death to basically normal functioning and back to work. 
Next patient is 67-year-old, different example. Um, he came in, uh, this was 304, weighed 264. His A1C for diabetes was 8.6. He was on two diabetic drugs. He had heart failure with an injection fraction of 36, two, two uh, diuretics, morning and evening, hypertension, two medications, hyperlipidemia on one medication. He had a stent three months prior to seeing me. He was on Plavix and aspirin for that. He'd had gout attacks uh, very frequently on allopurinol. He was in kidney failure, renal failure. Uh, he'd, had a, he'd already been to the surgeon to have a shunt pin in for kidney dialysis. The owner was 61, creatinine 3.9, and he had anemia of chronic kidney disease. Now, this is four years later. Uh, he, he's 3 to 39. His sugar is normal. He's off uh, one of the two medications. His beer and creatinine of his kidney failure have completely reversed uh, and is normal. He's off his Lasix. His swelling is gone. His ejection fraction in his heart is returning to normal. His anemia of chronic disease is corrected. He's off the allopurinol, Zyac, Plavix. His blood pressure is normal. And most importantly to him, he's had no hospitalizations. He's on four medicines instead of nine. He'd been to, the, to Europe, climbed in the Alps. He made $50,000 on a Bayetta stock tip that I gave him, and he was a pretty happy guy. Now, what's the dramatic thing in this? What's the number in this slide that jumps out at you? It's remarkable. I want to volunteer it. Now, when, when Bo got out of the uh, Army when he was uh, 21, he weighed 160 pounds. That's his lean weight. He's still 239. He's 80 pounds overweight. And he's lost basically only 25 pounds in four years. Yet his medical conditions have completely corrected, or mostly corrected, and he's had a normal functioning life. Okay? So it's not the weight loss, it's not the obesity that's the issue, it's the diet. So the only, only change in these two patients is we offered the medical nutrition therapy that nobody else did, and they got better. Now I'm an internist, and I'm a very mainstream internist. I use every drug that's available to my, to my uh, abilities, and I'm not um, anti-drug. But when a treatment works better, uh, I use it. And this treatment works uh, very well in many patients. So obviously from these two cases, nutrition and physiology are connected. They're connected uh, intimately. So what, when, and how are they connected? And if you are going to use this, what are the clinical outcomes that you're going to measure? And what about double-blind placebo-controlled studies, uh, Dr. Owen? Well, if you've ever tried to do nutrition studies, these are the variables in the case. In any case, in any nutrition study done anywhere, these are the variables. And if, to, to say the least, they are substantial and uh, 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 plentiful. But the single most important thing is patients lie. And they lie, why? Because we inject on them that if you just do this, uh, and you have lots of will and lots of character, uh, you're going to do well. Um, and, of course, they don't want to not be a characterless person with no power, so they just simply lie. Even at Pennington uh, Research Center in Baton Rouge, which is the largest nutrition research center in the world, they have a confined um, um, living area where they keep their patients. They have in their video cameras people sneaking the food in at night. During the study, which they volunteered for to, to uh, implement weight loss and nutrition therapy, sneaking food in at night like a prison. So um, you basically, it's very difficult to trust the results you're going to see in these type of studies. The only thing that's important, the only thing, is it safe, is it effective? Can you measure the results subjectively and objectively? Why subjective? Because the, the patient I just presented doesn't care that, that uh, his A1C is 5.6 or that he's off, uh, that, that he's, um, his uh, lipid profile is normalized. All he cares about is that he's functional, that he's off a bunch of medication that cost him a fortune, and that he hadn't had to go back in the hospital. So he only cares about the subjective symptoms. And that's where his motivation comes from. Your motivation and obligation, on the other hand, are the objective findings like the A1C and so forth. So they're both very important in uh, compliance and in management. These are conditions that you can treat that are, that are chronic medical conditions that are treatable with nutrition therapy. And again, most every, anybody walking in the office is going to have these. These are the acute ones. And again, those two examples I just gave you uh, show how quickly uh, that it can respond. So this is what I really want to talk about, which is the basic, basic nutrition physiology. How are these things connected? How are fat cells and muscle cells and the vascular system, the nervous system, and the gastrointestinal tract talking to each other? And what happened in those patients? What was I seeing and measuring 
that made sense out of this whole system. We're all born with this little happy fat cell. It's fairly small. It has a certain color under the microscope. Um, we go through our teenage years in America and in Western culture, and we start to plump up. Fat cell starts to change. It gets larger. Uh, it actually takes on different biochemical characteristics. We get into our 40s and middle age, and it's, it really takes on a different uh, appearance under the microscope. And then, uh, all of a sudden, in middle age and beyond, we're getting sick and, and not really knowing exactly what's happening to us. And uh, this fat cell is producing lots of uh, uh, proteins and, and products that are mi mitigating and mediating disease processes, uh, like the ones we just talked about. And these are some of the things that, that are measured back in the 90s. So how is this happening? It's happening because the fat cell is producing small peptides called cytokines. These mediate immunity, inflammation, vascular tone, hematopoiesis, coagulation, even behavior. And they're autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine. So uh, basically they go inter in intracellular, intercellular, and intra-organ. They're made by fat cells, but they're also made by the, uh, by the white uh, blood cell system and lymphocytes. And most importantly, they bind us to membrane receptors, they signal via second messengers, and they alter gene expression. They're hormones. And we have discovered um, that, that different tissues will make this, unlike the, say, thyroid hormone, which is made only by the thyroid gland, cytokines are made by different tissues. So leptin, uh, the, the grandfather of cytokines, is made predominantly by fat cells, but it's also made by the brain, by the intestine, possibly by the, mu uh, by the uh, muscle. Uh, it's pleiotrophic, and, and all of these cytokines have multiple functions, at least 17 that we know of for leptin. Um, they're redundant, so that interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor have very similar functions, even though they're different hormones. They're produced in cascade, so that interleukin-6 stimulates tumor necrosis factor, stimulates CRP, which then has a whole uh, replication of uh, functions. And depending on the tissue, they can act antagonistically or synergistically. So if you thought you had, had known and mastered endocrinology, we're now coming to that system and we multiply it times 100 complexity uh, and, you, and you have what we have with cytokines. But it makes sense, once you understand it, it makes sense of everything that you're seeing in clinical practice. This is a short list of the adipokines, uh, the uh, ones that are made by fat cells. And I'm not going to take the time to read down I'm gonna, uh, these. I'm gonna just, I'll give you a couple of examples in just a minute. Uh, the list, this was a slide a couple of years old. It's about three times this long now. Um, just in atherosclerosis, uh, these are the dipokines that mediate atherosclerosis. The only one that is anti-atherosclerotic is adiponectin. Does, uh, how many pe people here know what adiponectin is? One? Okay. Two? Three? Okay. A couple. Great. So I have something to teach you. So you have this fat cell that goes crazy um, and it mediates disease. Uh, and this, this uh, slide is pretty good in that it illustrates that all of these uh, peptides are being secreted, they are affecting physiology, and that physiology is being expressed as diseases. And you're the one that uh, the patient's coming to with these diseases saying, what's going on with me? <clears throat> uh, and you can see aging is put up there because uh, the prototypical uh, evidence of aging is wrinkling, the skin's getting saggy, uh, the bones are getting brittle, um, and uh, why is this occurring? Is it, is it just genes? No, there's something specifically biochemical happening that makes those physical signs appear. And the fat cell is one of the many mediators of that process. I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to show you again uh, how common and prevalent this is. Now, if you've never heard about adiponectin, it is the most uh, predominant hormone in the body. It's more prevalent than DHEA, which is the second most predominant hormone in the body. Um, and it has many very potent mechanisms of action. Um, it uh, has inverse insulin sensitivity, so that the higher the adiponectin, the more sensitive you are to insulin. Lower the adiponectin level, the more insulin resistant you are. It changes free fatty, uh, fatty, free fatty acid uptake in the muscle and liver, which also affects insulin resistance. It's decreased by high fat, high sugar diets and high fat, high sugar meals. And I want to emphasize that meals, not just a whole dietary plan. Um, it's increased dramatically after gastric bypass within a week. It localizes in skeletal muscle and liver, so that seems to be its primary mechanism of action. 
Um, it increases free fatty oxidation, increases glucose transport, decrease, it's decreased by tumor necrosis factor and other inflama inflammatory peptides. Now, what does that mean? That means if you have an inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis, it can decrease adiponectin and increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. And for those of you prescribing hormone therapy, higher estrogen levels are associated with higher adiponectin levels. And I'm going to show you why that one statement flies in the face of everything that was published by the Women's Health Initiative, a whole different subject, um, and, and flies in the face of what all the predominance of the literature showed us about the protective effects of estrogen for the last 20 years prior to the Women's Health Initiative. This is just the vascular effects of adiponectin. Vasodilator, nitric oxide production, angiogenesis, it decreases vascular adhesion molecules, uh, tumor, tumor necrosis factor and other inflammatory cytokines, uh, et cetera. So it's a very omnipotent uh, hormone in the vascular system. Um, it is made, uh, it is affected by visceral fat. This, this patient has exactly the same amount of uh, BMI and the same amount of body fat. But one is visceral fat and one is subcutaneous fat. A, as you all know, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the amount of visceral fat you have and cardiovascular and metabolic diseases like diabetes. Why does that occur? It, it's because the, these fat cells are acting like hormone cells and mediating those processes. This is the adiponectin levels in somebody with a pot belly on the right and a non-obese person on the left. And you can see people who have uh, 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 gynoid obesity, that is big hips and a narrow waist, uh, tend to have somewhere in between. So fat mass itself can affect adiponectin levels. This is, a, to me, again, for those of you who prescribe hormone therapy, a very interesting slide. At the top, you can see that these women are the non-users and hormone users, same age, uh, same year since menopause, menopause, same body weights, same BMI, same resting energy expenditure uh, metabolism, um, no, same glucose, lower insulin levels in the hormone users. Why does that occur? Um, and finally, visceral abdominal uh, fat size. So anybody here ever have a dog or a cat that's been spayed and neutered? What happens to them? blow up. Where's all the fat in that animal? It's on the trunk and in the belly. Duh. Um, you can see that you have at least a third more abdominal fat in the non-hormone users. This was 17-bed estradiol in this particular study, uh, but you can see it in other estrogens as well. And there's a direct correlation between estrogen and adiponectin and cardiovascular risk. Now, uh, the BMI in this particular group of women was 20, 25, 26, so a fairly, fairly lean group of women. Uh, the Women's Health Initiative, the BMI was 28, average BMI, but they didn't measure waist size. So I called the woman that was head of the, the Women's Health Initiative and said, did you measure waist size? Why not? Not happy to talk to me. There's a 500% increased risk if you're, as a female, your waist size is over uh, 35 inches, and a 500% uh, increased risk of cancer, and an 800% increased risk of cardiovascular disease if your waist size is over 35 inches. Average age of 62 in the Women's Health Initiative, how many people do you think had a waist size of 35 inches? Most of them. If only 10% in that population had a waist size over 35 inches, the data is null and void. I ran the data. It's null and void. So all of us who were here to forward to that study going, wait a minute, uh, we think estrogen is good, uh, and all of a sudden now you have to get a, a, a legal disclosure before you prescribe it, um, it's because they did not understand the science behind what they were looking at. Finally, uh, this will be probably your, your single best uh, screening risk for cardiovascular uh, risk in the next uh, couple of years. If your adiponectin levels are high, you have a very little chance of having heart attack or stroke. If your levels are below five, you have a 50-50 chance of having heart attack or stroke within five years. Uh, that is pretty dramatic. Uh, and again, correlates with the abdominal fat cell. Resistant causes insulin resistance, causes diabetes, 15 times more expressed in abdominal fat cell, and at the bottom, most importantly, increased by high calorie, high fat, high sugar meals. PI-1, plasminogen activator inhibitor, uh, again, secreted primarily by abdominal fat cells. It, as you know, it inhibits fib fibrinolysis um, and promotes atherosclerosis. But more importantly, at the bottom, 
It's decreased by low-fat, low-calorie meals and or weight loss. And on a very low-calorie diet, like in the first patient I presented, it decreases uh, levels by 50% in one week. The number one heart attack day of the year, does anybody know it? There is a day where there's a massive spike in heart attacks. We just had it. Day after Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving. Second number two day of the year, day after Christmas. Number three and number four, the two days after that. Why the days after Thanksgiving, the days after Christmas? Is it a high stress time? No. Your pi levels, your pi one levels shot through the roof. Your angiotensinogen two levels shot through the roof, so you got more, you were able to clot more. You accumulated a massive amount of fluid. Some of you might have seen it on the scale. Uh, your vessels were constricting. You had uh, excessive sympathetic activity, and wham, if you got a narrow vessel, bam, you have a heart attack. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go through the renin and angiotensin cascade, but we've now discovered abdominal fat cells are uh, avid producers of angiotensinogen 2. Uh, this is an aging conference, chemotractive protein. Uh, what's that, Dr. Owen? It, well, it's also made by abdominal fat cells. It increases inflammation in vessels, joints, and soft tissue. When I collected my data back in the 90s, uh, and I collected a number of different parameters, the number one thing to improve the fastest, and these are big people I treat, joint pain joint pain. We got 61% of our patients off all uh, pain medication in 12 weeks. Why was that occurring? Yeah, they hadn't lost that much weight in 12 weeks, and a 400 pound person is now, you know, 360, 370, big deal. Uh, that, I'm not changing biomechanics without weight loss, but what I am changing are the proteins being secreted by the fat cells. Um, it increases metalloproteases. Metalloproteases destroy our collagen. So when you start, when you, when you see somebody with that little lateral ear crease, um, hopefully everybody here knows what a lateral ear crease is. It's a little wrinkle in the lobe of the ear that has an 88% correlation with cardiovascular disease. And go look at the mirror when you leave here and see if you got a little lateral ear crease. Um, why would you get a crease in your ear if you have cardiovascular disease? As the pre one of the previous speakers noted, there's no blood supply to the earlobe uh, to amount to anything except capillaries. Well, metalloproteases. They're destroying collagen. And an experienced clinician, if you've been in practice like <clears throat> me and my colleagues have for 30 years, <clears throat> when the patient's walking into the room, you can tell what's wrong with them nine times out of ten. Because I'm looking at their wrinkles on the forehead, I'm looking at the ear creases, I'm looking at how they're breathing, I'm looking at their color, all of these changes that clinically we knew were associated with risk. Now I can explain why they're occurring. Increased by high fat, high sugar meals, not just the chronic diet. Uh, leptin, this is a grandfather, the last one I'm going to tell you about, um, that's produced by fat cells. And we know it's an it's a appetite regulator. Uh, we thought it was going to be the holy grail of, uh, of uh, obesity treatment back in the 90s. Uh, turns out it wasn't, but we le sure learned a lot, and it is what set off our uh, quest for finding the holy grail through all these cytokines. Uh, if you have a middle-aged woman who's having swelling in her feet, uh, she's hyperleptinemic if you have no other uh, valid cause for it, like heart failure or, high, or uh, chronic kidney disease. That's because the ve vessels are, are permeable, they're leaking, uh, and they're coagulating a little bit more avidly. I've got 18 pregnancies in previously infertile women in my clinic, 18 pregnancies who had been to, through fertility treatment and gotten pregnant following our nutrition regimen. Um, there are at least seven pathways that we know of from the gonadotropin releasing hormones all the way down to how the ovum and implants into the uterus mediated by leptin. So it is probably one of the keys, especially in obesity-related uh, infertility and PCOS, uh, probably the mediator of that process. So we know the fat cell, uh, it combined it with a gene that's uh, disadvantaged, uh, like a diabetic uh, person, age it, overfeed it, and we have disease. Um, and these fat cells uh, start out normal and uh, start hypertrophying, and then they develop inflammatory cells that start secreting cytokines. And one last slide. I'm not going to have time to get to the nutrition section of, of this, uh, but one last slide. Um, if you overfeed a, uh, uh, a person with the wrong genetics and that cell hypertrophies, it secretes these inflammatory peptides which go to the liver and the muscle causes insulin resistance, which causes dyslipidemia, hypertension, hyperglycemia, and then you get atherosclerosis, where have we been treating the patient on this scale? 
Well, when I started my practice, said somebody came over with a heart attack, they got morphine, nitroglycerin, and oxygen. That's all we had. I don't, may, may not look that old, but I'm that old. And shortly thereafter, we started uh, bypassing them. Shortly thereafter, we started uh, stenting them back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, then we started treating um, their diseases better, like the cholesterol and the blood pressure and the, uh, and the diabetes. Now we're treating uh, the resist insulin resistance syndromes. We've got to slop ass backwards. We should be treating the originator of the problem, the overnutrition combined with the genetics, and we won't see those results. Um, and finally, uh, medical nutrition therapy really should, you should understand the behavioral strategy that you're implementing, and it's very complex and very uh, multidisciplined as to, to what affects the brain, and you really need to understand the physiologic strategy. Going through this uh, uh, hopefully is just a window uh, into that process. Um, we do also, at, at my booth, we have an online presentation where this, the, the entire um, uh, program is uh, presented. This, this slide I did not make up for this uh, for Las Vegas. Uh, I put this slide into my deck about uh, five years ago. Pleasures of the flesh equals ha habits of the animal, and um, uh, basically we have found that. Uh, the inability to avoid a substance of harm in spite of intense mental effort and organized avoidance is an addiction. So when your patients are, have an intense mental effort to uh, follow a diet plan and they cannot avoid it, uh, think of the terms of, of why that might be occurring. So in, uh, as I said, in booth 1000 in the, the uh, section, we, will, uh, uh, we have the links to this to, for the whole slide. All right. Thank you all.